Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This piece was brought to you by Roberta's, robertaspizza.com. I'm HRN's Communications Director, Kat Johnson, with a preview of this week's episode of Meat and Three, our weekly food news roundup. It's Thanksgiving, so we're talking turkey with sweet potato casserole, stuffing, cranberry sauce, and pecan pie. But we're also discovering some surprising truths about this holiday. As it turns out, roasted turkeys are actually nowhere near the original Thanksgiving tables. In fact, most of the foods we eat for Thanksgiving today weren't eaten in Plymouth. And you know, a lot of the dishes came about, well, because of the products that were on the shelves and the marketing that told us this is the product we should use. Every once in a while, though, the consumer creates the food trend. Care to top the turducken, anyone? Uh, I've got to give credit to this fellow that said this is the best pile of meat I've ever had, and then said, but if you added bacon... Tune in to this week's Meet and 3 on Heritage Radio Network, available wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I am one of your hosts, Darren Bresnitz. This week, we sit down with Bon Appetit's editor-at-large and the host of Netflix's upcoming cooking competition show, The Final Table, Andrew Knowlton. He gives us his insights on how they put together BA's annual Hot 10 list, how to go about working 24 hours at America's most iconic restaurants, and a peek behind the apron into the world's largest cooking competition show ever, The Final Table. It was an absolute pleasure to sit down and pick his brain. To get you in the holiday season, we recommend a show from our archives, episode 209, Mom Bresnitz and a Bunch of Dead People. She talks to us about her annual Thanksgiving plan, her traditions, and how she makes that turkey so, so tasty. Also, episode 207 is a shout out to Chef Patty Jackson, who recently closed Delaware and Hudson, or announced its closing coming up at the end of November. We love the restaurant. It's where I told my wife that I loved her and wanted to be with her forever. Patty, we will truly miss your incredible food. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Snacky Tunes on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. We talk about food. We talk about music. With musical dudes. Finger on the pulse. Snacky Tunes. Hello and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I am one half of your host, Darren Bresnitz. We are sitting in the incredible offices over here at Netflix. Honestly, just the cafeteria alone is impressive. Not to mention the slate of shows, which is why we're really here, because we are sitting with Andrew Knowlton, editor-at-large of Bon Appetit, and host of the new epic international cooking competition show, The Final Table. Andrew, welcome to Snacky Tunes. Thanks for having me. Finally, man. I've been, I've been waiting for you guys to invite me on this show, and all it took was a Netflix show. Huh? Yeah, uh, it's really simple. <laughs> we have very, very low standards. You just have to host a Netflix show. Uh, just ask Phil Rosenthal. He knows the drill, too. Great. Um, so uh, the show was awesome. I've been lucky enough to watch the four, first four episodes. Awesome. I actually had to hold back from writing Matt to see if you could send me the next six episodes <laughs> because I was like, I can't believe I have to wait. But so it goes. Very engaging. Good. I hope so. I yeah. mean, I've watched them kind of while lying in bed with kind of one eye, you know, one hand covering one eye, you know, because it's no fun to watch yourself. But I think I mean, we can talk about this. The cool thing is just the scale of it and, and the amazing talent that they were able to, to The talent's to get. amazing, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we're going to get to that, but I want to go 
all the way back to the beginning to when you were a wee lad. A wee pup. A wee pup. Uh, where'd you grow up? Who cooked in the family? Mom, dad, grandma? When, uh, did, when did food start entering your world? So born in, in Florida, which most people don't know, uh, Gainesville, Florida. Shout uh, out. Shout out to the Gators. I actually hate the Gators, but Ooh. we won't go there. We don't have enough time. <laughs> We've learned, because sometimes we'll toss in a side end about sports. And then you go and on a tangent. that's where like, oh, wait, never mind. We, don't I, have we could do like three others just on sports. Oh, we could. We want to do that. We could. Uh, don't remember that's Florida. Moved to... Uh, Atlanta, okay. uh, which is basically where I was raised. Um, my mom was m- the cook. She was a good cook. She was good at cooking like five dishes. What? Like five nights a week, and then you order pizza yeah. the there and Chinese she, on Saturday, she, Sunday? You know, she was like shrimp Diane. I mean, she was that classic like 80s, 70s, 70s 80s kind of cook. Beautiful. Uh, what my parents were great at, and I hated it at the time, is there's this this street, when I say street, it's more of an avenue in Atlanta called Buford Highway. Mm-hmm. Perhaps you've been. Yep. And that was where all the international restaurants were. Sure. And it was like you could eat Malaysian food, obviously Mexican food, Korean, anything you wanted. And my dad, uh, for whatever reason, being a kid from West Virginia, I don't know where he got the, the bug, but would take us pretty much every weekend to one of these new international restaurants. And there was this one place called Star of India. And mm. I, and I can you swear on this? Can yeah, say whatever you want. I fucking hated this restaurant. <laughs> it's okay. I have a Greek restaurant that my parents <laughs> took me to on South Street in Philadelphia growing up that I fucking, I was like, I can't believe we're going. <laughs> and now I just dream about the charbroiled chicken. Right. Well, right? My, that's the go. same trajectory that I have. So I hated it. I cried. I just remember like putting my head in this banquette and just like they would try to, do you want a Coca-Cola? I was like, no, I don't want a Coca-Cola. I want to go home. And I would just lay there. And then one, I don't know what happened. Maybe I got hungry finally. Finally. And somebody brought, they brought me some naan and they had some like, uh, I loved okra as a kid for some reason. They had some, um, an okra dish mm. and some chicken tikka masala. Just, you know, your basic kind of uh, Anglo Indian food. And a light bulb went in my head and I kind of, things changed for me at that moment. Mm. Uh, and I didn't cry anymore. And so then I, my dad would take me to various other places and, you know, had pho for the first time and would go have Korean barbecue and all that. Um, so then I kind of, that kind of lit this food fire How old in were me. you? I was probably eight or nine at the time. Hmm. To be that aware of food at a young well, age. Well, I wasn't like deeply like thinking about locality and origin. I just no. know it finally tasted good. You're like, oh, right. okay. There's a, there's a larger world outside of there's these a larger, five dishes. Yes, out of home. macaroni and cheese and like grits that I would make wrong with in that. the morning. Uh, again, I liked okra, so it wasn't that bad. But, you know, I hated raw tomatoes. Like, what kid likes raw tomatoes? Like, I know. Very few. I know. Well, hopefully your daughters like raw tomatoes. Not yet. They like a lot of things, but I'm still working on the, the tomatoes. That's like the final, like That's pickles final. and raw, raw right. tomatoes. Is and you do that whole lecture about, do you know where ketchup comes from? Yeah. And they go, is there sugar <laughs> yeah. in a raw tomato? So you grow up in Atlanta yep. and you actually traveled abroad to Italy in high school. Uh, that was actually in college. Oh, in college. Yes. Uh, so you travel abroad, but you start like looking out into the world. I wanted to get out of the South. Yeah. Growing up in the South is like... It was, you know, I went to a very religious school. Okay. Uh, and where we went to chapel every day. And it was, it was, it had a good influence on me, but I just wanted to get the hell out of the South. Yeah. Because uh, uh, this is what, 90s? This South? is 90s, 90. I graduated high school in 1993. 90s South was a different place. I mean, well, food also wasn't, food wasn't, no, what it, it wasn't was. celebrated where it was. I mean, you could go to some great, kind of greasy spoon places, yeah. but it wasn't this amazing thing. So there's an old Tom Waits line that, like, when he's talking about moving out west, is like, I didn't understand the East Coast until I moved to the West. Sure. And for me, I didn't understand the South until I moved to the North. Right. When, you know, people, I would have, I would make pimento cheese, like, in college, just because that was an easy thing for me to make for my lunch or if I was going to classes, and people would literally look at me like, what are you, you know, I, I imagine I've heard David Chang Talk about like when he went to school, like kimchi, eating yeah. kimchi in school. Certainly not the same thing, but pimento cheese doesn't, you know, have that same effect on a room like kimchi. But it was that same kind of like, wow, you're different. not eating what we different. eat. Different, yeah, you know? it's different. <laughs> um, so, what brought you north? I just, I just wanted to escape. Wanted a small little rinky dink school in Maine. Uh, went to Bates College. Shout out to Bates. Shout out to Bates. Didn't 
and they're going to hate this, didn't love Bates. Fine. My line is, I love the opportunities that it afforded me. That's fine. Uh, I So that's when I traveled to, I was a philosophy major for whatever reason. Fantastic. How's that working out? Great. Heidegger, he, he, Heidegger and Hegel still have no idea what they were saying. Kierkegaard <laughs> on, a, on a whole different level. If we eat, do we exist? Exactly. There we go. Still still working on that one. Uh, and so went, went um, let's see it. So you went to, you traveled, is that the first time you made it out of the country? No, no, no. My, my father did missionary work, uh, hospital missionary okay. work. So I'd gone to Africa uh, a few times, Amsterdam. But that was the first time I'd ever been to Italy, like to Europe. I'd been to some kind of, but never Paris or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because those travels wound up influencing some of your writings down the road. I totally define about who you are. a short history of... Uh, your long life of drinking. Yes. <laughs> uh, but it was interesting to see like when things start clicking in for you uh, for moments in your life and they start defining like your career, like the moments that you write about later down the road. Right, and you only realize that looking back on them. Oh, yeah. You know, it was that Indian restaurant and then I remember going to Athens, Greece and, you know, waking up one morning and I hear all this commotion and this busy street that was usually filled with cars was now filled with uh, mostly older Greek women selling this amazing produce. And you're like, what? And is I this? just, I was like, I've never been around a farmer's market like that before. No, because now when you go to a country, you're just like Saturday farmer's market. You know. You know you know that when the weekend rolls around, you're going to get up and go. Absolutely. But bef- by then, or back then. I, I had no idea. Like, I didn't know, I didn't know anything at that point. I knew that, like, I kind of knew who Alice Waters was. I knew who Julia Child, and I knew who, like, James Beard. That was pretty much it. Paul Prudhomme, maybe, because my parents loved to go to New Orleans and eat Cajun food, Creole food. Uh, But no idea. So that was like, I was like, holy crap. So that's when I got back to to Maine. I started really cooking and really reading, like reading MFK Fisher Mm. and reading all these kind of old school writers who just, again, lit this fire. So when did you start writing? Or let me ask a better question. (laughs) When did you think about the concept of writing about food. Because let's level set, it's mid to late 90s. Right. The idea of writing about food is a very obscure, esoteric type of adventure. Right. Like, what's the scene of food writing in that time? There there was nothing. I mean, there was local, there was like John McPhee in The New Yorker writing about oranges once in a while, mm. you know, or you had uh, Calvin Trillin, who like I started to read that well, stuff. Well, he's, I mean. Yeah, he's the best. I mean, come on. That guy is, you want a good bedtime story. And I think it was those, we would make sporadic trips from, from Lewiston, Maine down to New York City. Um, and I had a friend who had more money than I did. So he would kind of like, we would go to these kind of fancy restaurants, fancy restaurants like Pichelin and Ooh. Oriole and like, cool uh, most of these were during restaurant week. So it yeah. was like 1997. Sure. Like that was the price and the year. That's yeah. what they used to do it that way. Oh, right. Uh, I remember one time we went to Le Cote Basque, which is an amazing old school oh, French yeah. place. And it was, it was either you had salmon or you had kidneys. Mm. And I never had kidneys before, so I ordered the kidneys, and I fucking hated the kidneys. Sure. So I spent the whole meal with these little kidneys, and you could tell because they were cut in half, and that you could see the nephron in yeah. them. I spent the entire meal figuring out how to not eat all the mashed potatoes so that I could stuff all the kidneys underneath the mashed potatoes so the waiter wouldn't make fun of me. Oh, yeah. And I even took... I, I took two of them into the bathroom and flushed them down the toilet because I was so ashamed that I couldn't eat the kidneys. I mean, you felt big in that moment ordering, and then they show up and you go, Ugh. oh. No. But you, everyone's been there. When they're like, I'm going to be adventurous, and then you go, I, I might just not order what I don't like to eat. So to answer your question, it was at that time when I was in New York City eating out that I started just to consume every source of media, the, you know, the, the Wednesday New York Times with the, f- the food section. I mean, the epicenter really around that time was New York. It was. I and, mean... And that, I'm assuming that's what drew you to the city? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I ended up going to NYU uh, after college for basically as an excuse to live in New York. And I convinced my parents somehow to let me go to NYU for this publishing course. Great. 
publishing. It was all it was all print media yeah. too, at the time. No, no, no. I'm aware. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm aware. Um, Have you heard of print media? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I like print media. I like read. You know, reading reading words that you can hold in your hand is actually it is a great thing. A very delicious. It's endeavor. a great thing. Um, so when do you start writing? When do you start thinking about Bon Appetit? Well, that was so I was at NYU and I was actually working at a now defunct magazine called Lingua Franca, which was like an academic magazine that was kind of irreverent. A lot of great writers, uh, A.O. Scott, who now writes for the uh, mm-hmm. New York Times, uh, Emily Aiken, who worked for Vogue for a while, Alex Starr, who's you know amazing, way smarter than I will ever be. I was doing that while going to NYU, and I uh, walked past at NYU a bulletin board, like not a not a not a oh. com- virtual. I remember those bulletin boards. <laughs> remember I remember at college when I was like, I need some extra cash. <laughs> Okay, I can be a waiter for a night. And there was a sign up there, and I kid you not, it said, looking for a guy Friday. Not a, you know, not, no, 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 the no, old no. phrase, a guy oh, yeah. Friday, guy or gal Friday, to temp at a food magazine. And I was like, well, hell, I'll look in that. So I called the number, because I don't even think... From a landline. From a landline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did it have a cell phone? Um, and it was for Bon Appetit, and it was one or two days a week. And my first... When I got there, you know, I'd done my homework because actually, a side note, when I was when I was doing this publishing course at NYU, I'd written this paper comparing and contrasting gourmet with Bon Appetit, Ooh. which I can send that to you guys. It's oh, yeah. Really compelling. Still reading, controversial as you can today? Yes, yeah, still controversial. Riveted. I think I think I to be honest with you, I think I said that gourmet was better. <laughs> and then, and then, yeah. But at the time, that was like the magazine. Oh, yeah. No, that um, was the echelon. So my first job for Bon Appetit, I was working for a woman named Tanya Winman Steele. And my job was to call, she gave me a list of restaurants around the country, to call these restaurants and have them fax their menus. I feel like we need a lexicon key mm-hmm. when this goes up so that listeners People under 22 understand the technology of the time. And 212-286-2747 is the old fax number that was is ingrained in my head from calling all these restaurants. And you would get these like... Thousands of them a day coming in these, and you know, they would all Adam curl up. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's out, Adam. It's like, yeah, yeah. That really thin paper. Oh, gosh. And you, half of you couldn't <laughs> read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, there wasn't, they didn't have websites. That was it. And so you get in there, you prove your worth. When do you feel confident to pitch your first story? Do you remember the first story you pitched? I do, I do. It was in 19, it was 2000. It was mm-hmm. right before 9-11. Uh, the year before 9-11, and it was, it was in the front of the book section for magazine people out there, kind of the small thing, and it was an article on, and my wife thinks this is funny, it was all about hangover cures sure. from around the world. P- hey, pitch what you know. So I did Menudo from Mexico, sure. apparently in Puerto Rico, if you cut a, a lime or a lemon in half and stick it under your armpit for a while, that apparently helps. Why not? I tried all of them. Uh, and I think the conclusion on that story, I still remember my kicker was, again, this is 1999, is uh, the best hang for, hang, uh, cure for hangover is to not drink anything at all. Yeah. What, what fun is that? What fun is that? Uh, so that was the first story, and then it just kind of like... I, I, I started to make restaurants my beat. That was, that was like, I was never in the test kitchen so much. I was reporting on other stuff. Everyone did entertaining stuff. But restaurants is what I made. I studied everything. Now, obviously the places that Bon Appetit or things they're going to cover is going to have great food as a base. But did the stories of the restaurant draw you in? Or what brought you to focus on them? Well, I mean, I think early on it was just getting to eat out, you know, hey. and have somebody else pay for it. It's a great record. But, but it was interesting because it's, it's, it's a good question because I don't, back in those days, people maybe weren't so interested in the people behind the food. Oh, yeah. It was just about what was on your plate. It was about the foie gras or it was kind of eating something that you had never eaten in your life before. And you didn't really think about where Danielle Ballou came from in Lyon, or you didn't necessarily consider where the, the person making the uh, pupusa on this corner was from. Like, uh, maybe some people did, but it wasn't something that, it was just about the pure pleasure of eating food. When did you start to see that shift? How long until your, te- until well, your tenure? Well, I mean, I think, I think when I started, when, when, 
it was probably like mid 2000s, I think, when more of these international restaurants started to come to the forefront. It mm-hmm. wasn't just this, at least for a lot of like white suburban people, it wasn't just like, oh, let's go there on Sunday. It became this thing that like, no, this is the most thrilling food that you can eat in America right now and seeking out those experiences. And then when you would go to Flushing or you would go, you know, uh, to San Gabriel Valley when I was coming out to L.A., you started to realize that there's a community and people creating this food. Someone's cooking it. Somebody's cooking this food. And I mean, that sounds like so duh now, but it was something that took me a long time. It's not just about what's on the plate. It's that story of how these people got here. It's about the family members that are all supporting it. And then it's about the people coming, not just people who grew up with that food. I mean, that's the great thing about the U.S. is like you go to a lot of other places in the country People aren't receptive to other food from around the world. They're mm-hmm. really not. You go to France. I mean, there's certainly that. But it's not like the United States where... No. There's a whole valley of Chinese whole, food. Yes. <laughs> Stuff that I will that, that you and I could start today and we would die before we could try every single one of those amazing and places. And even if we tried it, to try and really understand it no. would be crazy. Now, you spent or you've been at BA for 18 years. Yep. Um, and there's been a huge political and pop culture shift in food. Yeah. So when did you notice the biggest seismic shift? I know you, you mentioned a little bit of like the inklings that things have changed. Mm-hmm. And do you feel somewhat responsible for helping make that shift happen? Well, I mean, I, I feel it's – I think, you know, the past five or six years, I think, in food has really – and it's been a learning process for me to open my eyes. And I had to start to question myself like – why I, Why as, as BA are we reporting on s- these people and perhaps not other people? Mm-hmm. And, you know, that goes with, you know, who is employed at different places, who's working there, the kinds of people. And I think th- th- we can all do a better job of that, and the food industry can still do sure. a hundred times better job than they're doing right now. But I think it was just... I think it was just my, you know, becoming that much more curious and, and, you know, realizing that the amazing depth and variety of foods we have in the United States come from, you know, our immigrants mm-hmm. and wanting to, to shine a light on those people. I mean, I think if you look at the Hot Ten list this year, you know, I didn't go out with some sort of agenda, but this is just how people eat in 2018. You yeah. know, they, they're going to have Cambodian food from some from a woman who was a nursing student and then now is cooking the, the recipes of her ancestors. Or they want to go to this place in Boston that does the most amazing soba that you've ever, or excuse me, udon that you've ever had. Um, so I think for me it was just, you know, becoming kind of woke to the whole the whole situation. We and you know the food media is you know this. I know. Is a is a it's a small little world. Yeah. And it's a very the, the path to each restaurant is very it's a well uh, traveled path. Um and I think it just dawned on, you know, like I was never somebody who like, oh, there's a press release about this place. Like let's, let's run and and go to that place. Um but I just always wanted to and I think that that is what BA does, and that's what every media person should do, and that's what every diner who loves food is like to seek out those places. It's, it doesn't have to be in a fancy magazine. It doesn't have to be get a four star review. And you know, we're in LA right now, and you talk about Jonathan Gold. I know, and somebody like that who, who whatever you want to say, but that that gentleman introduced so many people who normally would not have been introduced to foods and encouraged them to go to places. That's what it's all about at the end of the day, for me, is getting people to try things outside of their comfort zone. Awesome. Well, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to talk about the Hot 10 and those sort of influences on the list as it's evolved. And we're also going to talk about you being an editor-at-large and working 24 hours at some of America's most famous places. You're listening to Snacky Tunes on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. We have a song from the archives. We'll be back in just a minute.
Hello and welcome back to Snacky Tunes. We are here with Andrew Knowlton, editor at large of Bon Appetit and host of Netflix globe spanning storytelling cooking competition show, The Final Table. Now, uh, before the break, we were talking about your role, Jonathan Gold's role, mm-hmm. sort of the food media's role in the last five or six years of really opening people's eyes to both the people who were making the mm-hmm. food and then the road left traveled mm-hmm. uh, for restaurants. Um, and you've definitely seen the influence uh, as the curator, one of the people behind uh, the Hot 10 Best New Restaurants mm-hmm. list, which is Bon Appetit's every year awesome sort of look into like what's happening in America. Right. Um, and this year was no exception. I mean, you had, as you mentioned before, a lot of international flavors popping in. Uh how do you start to look at the list now versus maybe when the list started mm-hmm. from a story point of view? Yeah, well, I think that's – there's so many lists out there. I mean – Well, that's the thing. You, everyone's got a list Everyone's now. got a list. And we Now, realize, I go to TripAdvisor. That's my, <laughs> those are my guys. I go, I, you know, nice job. I'm glad you do the research. This, this, this podcast is over. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, a real TA type of guy. You know, but I will say there was a restaurant that we put on the um, – a hot 10 list maybe five or six years ago in D.C. called uh, Little Cerro. Oh, yeah. Great Thai place. Yeah. And I was I went back there one time when I was there and because there was nowhere to eat. I just wanted to go be by myself and eat this place. And there was this young woman next to me, and we started talking. And I was like, just curious, like, how you found out about this place. She's like, well, I was in town for a meeting, and I just got on Yelp, and it said that this restaurant was the best restaurant in the area. And that was, was like, well, you ended up at the right spot. Yeah. I thought she ended up at the right spot. Anyway, millions of lists out millions there. Millions of lists. Millions of lists. We realize that. So I think what what we have at BA Bon Appetit is is that w- what you just said. We have the opportunity to tell a story sure. about the food. It's not just like this is go good food, go eat it. But we want to teach people if they go to Ugly Baby in Brooklyn, New York, what makes that so special? It's the chilies that make it so special. So let's break down and do a short little cooking class on the way that uh, Siri Chai, the chef there, uses chilies. Mm-hmm. Or if Friedman's in in the hat you're wearing in Los Angeles. Shout out to Jenna and Nick. Great guys. That, you know, they came from a certain perspective. They'd grown up going to these Jewish de- delis and diners and wanted to kind of reinvent it. And, like, they did that. And they have 10 types of wallpaper. And so we really wanted to channel into that kind of crazy vibe that they that create. Vodka. That latke is one of the best things I ate in the past five years. That's why it's on the cover. So good. On the cover. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it for, for me personally, it became less about let's just go eat good food, but let's go find these places that have amazing stories behind them that also have good food, that create a vibe, that create an atmosphere, but that if you took Friedman's or you took Ugly Baby and put them in any other town, they wouldn't be the same restaurant. I feel like too many restaurants these days you could just pluck out sure. and throw into Louisville, Kentucky. Those are the restaurants that I do not jibe with. Yeah, I mean, you sort of get the idea of what a restaurant's about when a press release comes out or you walk in the doors yeah. going, oh, what's your story? And this is sort of the conflict that we've dealt with over the years going, the food is awesome, but the story sucks. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about this. Right. Because this is the flip of what you were talking about before, right? Because before, the story didn't matter. It didn't, it like, didn't, yeah. It, I mean, it mattered to a very select group of people. Right. But if it had the best food in New York, who cares if it was an immigrant story? Who cares if it was a restaurant group? But now... Or who, who cared what they were doing in the kitchen? Yeah, who cares? Uh, now, you have to have equal part story yep. and equal part good food. Right. And I think the two the two go hand in hand. The very rarely will you find a restaurant that has amazing food that there isn't some story that, that somebody's behind it or that there's a narrative behind that. It's just like any good any good movie or any good piece of literature, there's a story behind it. Behind the story. Yes. Now, obviously you have your top 50 and just to be in the top 50 out of all the new restaurants is I think it's cool. It's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. But when you start selecting the top 10, have you found in the last few years that having a better story will get you higher on the list than having better food? Oh, man. That's a tough question. I mean, I think when, when, you're, when you're, whether it's Julia Kramer, who's my colleague at Bon Appetit, whether we're sitting down or Adam Rappaport, who's the editor-in-chief at BA, sitting down kind of 
going from this 50 that we've winnowed down to the 10, we're trying to make a magazine that's compelling and that and that if there's a video associated with sure. it or it's going online. So, yeah, we're trying to, like, you need to have different kinds of restaurants. You need to hit different kind of beats. You need to have geographic diversity. And you need to have a good story. Everyone likes a good story. So... I would never say that I have put a place on a list that didn't have great food. I, if, if, if there's two but restaurants. That's the base. That's the base. If there's two restaurants that have equally um, amazing food and one is a more compelling story, you can answer that question yourself. I'm, I'm not in the hot seat. <laughs> I'm not in the hot seat. But yes, I mean, I think you need a good, you need a good backdrop, a good canvas of where you're putting the plate and, Absolutely. and where you're sitting in. Um, and I also want to, I think one thing that we want to do at BA is we want to shine a light on people who perhaps haven't had the light shined on them before. We, you know, I don't, we don't go like no disrespect to the big name chefs, but I think with the list or any list, your job, you know, David Chang has great restaurants and I, and I would, I would go on the record as saying this. I don't think I would put a David Chang restaurant on the list because frankly, David Chang doesn't need BA's help. Sure. He he. I want to I want to give the pedestal to other people who haven't had that opportunity before. But also, part of that is that you, as a storyteller, and the desire to break new stories and new restaurants, don't do. There's nothing to gain from putting David Chang on the list in the reciprocal way because everyone knows the David Chang story. Now, if David Chang dropped out of the food game and then came back and five years later was right. like, here's my new restaurant. If he was a drug addict and just strung out and then strung came Strung out back. and then he yeah. came back and he opened up a breakfast sandwich place and you're like, he's back and it's better than ever. That's a great story. That's a great story. Right. But, you know, in, in I mean, the place, the number one place this year you pick, I would say no one's, almost no one's heard of it. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I mean, even, and right. you even admit that you're flipping through Instagram. Yes. And you saw it. But is there that some desire especially in the number one or number two spot. Now, it's not every year, because like when you put Alma at the top of the list, right. at least people knew who it was. People knew that downtown LA was happening. It was sort of obvious, not obvious, but like... You had you, to bring Alma up, didn't you? you? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, but I'm saying like, that's a good example of a restaurant that people knew about. You're like, I'm that on the list. Like, people okay. in LA did. People, people in LA. People outside of, you know... But to target the number one this year... I mean, that was out of left field. That was out of left field, and I bet you people even in that hometown were like, "Oh, there was plenty of people in Oklahoma City who'd never heard of that." So, is there that sort of desire to break I, restaurants? Well, I mean, I don't. And it's, stories. It's, it's not the goal. Like, I put Maidan in Washington D.C., which is this Middle Eastern place, Absolutely. number two. That place has been written about in every publication known sure. to man. Uh, but, but that of, number one spot is a special spot. Of, it is a special spot. I think it's a special spot. Of course, there's. When I go to Oklahoma City, I discover this restaurant kind of through social media. I make a special trip to go to Oklahoma City, which I had never really been to before in a meaningful way. It looks great. It's amazing. And Bread you, basket? And you re- that's Kansas. That's Kansas. Yeah. <laughs> See, now the whole mis- Midwest hates you. I know. Um, and sitting down <laughs> at this- We're a real coastal <laughs> show. We know where our bread is butter. <laughs> well, Oklahoma City, they're going to be listening now. I know. Um, no, but when you sit down at that restaurant, that's the luxury that I have is being able to travel around the country and compare and contrast. That's why I do it over three months is just like hit you all at once. And those ones that really stand out, stand out. And that's what happened with not such. I'm not going to go so far out of a limb to be like, you know what, that restaurant really sucked. But I'm going to put it at number one because nobody's heard of it. I right. would never do that. Coming up with the top 10 list in its own kind of when you get down to it, it is a. It's crazy. Is it ridiculous? It's ridiculous. Yes. But. We live in a world that allows for ridiculousness. Loves, that, that allows for a lot of ridiculousness, and I embrace it. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's there's that. I want to go out and, you know, the way that Calvin Trillin wrote about Arthur Bryant's back in the day, his mm-hmm. barbecue place. Like, I want those places that represent BA and be like, that really changed our lives. And that's what you hear from. That's the power of our brand now. Is you hear those stories of like. We were about to go out of business. I heard it from somebody on the top 10 list. Like, we were not doing well, and that list comes out, and that puts butts in seats. That's the power of the list. It's just, and, and hopefully any list, but especially this list, is like, you can change somebody's fortune. Like, I guarantee you that Yumbai in, in, in the Fruitvale neighborhood of, of Oakland, the East Bay, 
like they are busier now and she's able to more people know about the amazing food that she's doing and realize her story. And if that affects them politically or socially, that's the power of food right there. I mean, now that food has become so politicized, especially uh, with immigrants mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. things like the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find more pressure of that list to put, you know, immigrant stories, women's stories and that the idea of just putting white males on the I mean, list? That, that's my my whole intention is to always represent like if somebody f goes back and looks at an issue in 2012 of that hot 10 list i think julia kramer and i would both agree that that represents what was happening in america at that 100%, time because there's some food trucks that pop up yes on there that and you the idea of putting a food truck now on the list seems a little funny you or, might or there was a food hall there was a food hall when food halls were yep. going on yeah so th there should be a time time snapshot to it right if you will and i think those places have a lot of these places have always existed, but that's my job is to go and to to seek out those places that represent where you and me and people a lot younger than us who we're, we're a food magazine too. Like we're not trying to appeal to somebody who's going to the Olive Garden every day. I don't we know. are we are trying There's a new boutique Olive Garden <laughs> uh, that's hopping in uh, the south of Oklahoma City. <clears throat> see now, see now you're just messing with Oklahoma no, City. <laughs> I love Oklahoma City. <laughs> No, but I get what you're saying. It's like there's a certain person who's going to pick up that issue regardless. Regardless. They're food lovers. They're and food they, And they want to know that next place to go to. They want to know that they should be eating Cambodian food, that they should be eating this Thai food, or that they should be eating hand-pulled udon noodles. And that's just, I feel like that is where the United States is at its best, is recognizing all those things. And if, if, if I cannot sit here and say that the, the current times we live in don't affect that, you know, I don't have an agenda out there, but like there's a lot of things I value in the U.S. and food is one of them. Mm -hmm. And the best food that I've ever eaten in the States is from people who have immigrated to this country. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when I think about where I spend my money and if I'm going to drive out to San Gabriel Valley yeah. versus some sort of chain Chinese food place, there's no question in my mind Absolutely. where I want to put my dollars. It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. But some people would go like, I just want my Panda Express. Right. And yes, do we that's, just lose our Panda Express that's... sponsorship? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely we lost it. But I know it's it's where you put it's where you put the pen on paper. Right. And I think and it's not like, oh, they can only be those places. I love the Waffle House, as I've documented many times. Exactly. That is a chain, but I I love that place. There's a piece of me in every Waffle House across the country. I, I love that place. Now, speaking about the Waffle House, the working 24 hours at is actually the flip side sort of to the Hot 10 list. Because right. the Hot 10 list is all about discovery of these places you have may have never seen. Mm -hmm. And the thing I like about working 24 hours at is that the, these places that you've seen a million times, you've probably never thought about the people that work there or what goes into it. And the story that you share really dives into the people who are there and what makes it both right. the customers and the people behind it. Um, now, I know that, you know, it was pitched and then Rappaport was like, you should go work there for 24 hours. Right. Um, well, I said I should go work there for eight hours. And, and then he, he said, said, that's not good. You should go work 24 hours. For 24 <laughs> hours. Um, but what made you uh, want to share these stories? Like, when did you start to realize that this was going from a, ho ho, like, <laughs> I'm here for 24 hours to go and, oh, there's something a lot deeper here. Oh, I think, I think the thing that I found is the more time I spent in restaurants, uh, and I worked at a restaurant in Brooklyn and had some knowledge of it, but just what a grind and how hard it is to run a restaurant. I don't care if it's a dumpling place that does one thing to, you know, an olive garden where there's a hundred things on the menu. It's hard, and it takes a lot of amazing people to, to run a place. And, and we as diners go in there, and we, I always make these snap judgments about music's too loud, light's not good, you know, something's wrong with this dish, something's wrong with that dish. And there's people behind those restaurants. So I think with the Waffle House, I had been to the Waffle House a million times. I've been there stone cold sober. I've been there three sheets, three sheets into the wind at 2 in the morning. And I, those people were so patient most of them women, were so patient with all kinds. You get a, you know, just a slice of America at a Waffle House, for better, for worse. Yeah. And it was just, I wanted to, like, report, like, who are these people who put up with all these jerks and, but also do it with a smile? 
so that was the real reason to, to Waffle House was the first installment to kind of, and that was the one I went to um, in Atlanta was the one that I'd probably been to a hundred times, you know, through high school because we used to sneak out of our house and we'd go to Waffle House. That was the only Ooh. place to go. Hope mom and dad aren't listening. Oh, they know that. It's well documented. Um, <laughs> you know, the thing that surprised me most about the Chick-fil-A episode yeah. was I just think of Chick-fil-A as a fast food grab-and-go place, but the one that you were at, they made everything from scratch. They made, And that's one of the few that, that's the original one. It's called the Dwarf House. It's a, it's a longer story. Yeah. Um, yeah, but they make everything from scratch, and that was like a, that, that one's one of, only one of two or three that's open 24 hours as well. And they have, they have like a diner there, too. Like, you can go and get hash browns and eggs, and it's right next to the airport. Next time you're at uh, the Atlanta airport and you're delayed, it's literally five minutes. You can go to, Done. it's in Hapeville, it's, Georgia. So you can check out Hateville? that. Hateville? Hate. Oh. I was like, Not wow. Hateville, no. They, they would have changed that name a long time. Um, one of the things I like about the show is that you, you, you said in one of them that you say, I'm sure doing this every day, respect, because yeah. it's a lot. And there's no TV show coming for these people that they're going to get mm-hmm. out of there. It's very much that this is the job that they have. And you definitely do a balance of both doing the job, but then also uh, respecting these people who do in and out because it's their job. It's their jobs. Um, how do you strike that balance? Like, how do you make sure that you're not coming in to these restaurants or these places and sort of not being like, "I would never do this." Well, that's 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 the hard thing, and that was the dilemma from day one. Is like, here I am coming with like not a camera crew, but a camera, sure, and a, a boom, a sound guy, and you know. I'm, I'm here for 24 hours, woe is me, and then walk out and I get to go get on a plane and go back to New York City. Right. Um, I think the way that, and, and I think there was a natural distrust at Waffle House, at Chick-fil-A, at Katz's, no matter where it was. Not so much Franklin Barbecue. No, Franklin Barbecue too, but they, they're only open for like five hours. Yeah. It's, you know, then you're just sitting there watching fire Watch, burn. Yeah. Um, but I think the biggest thing was earning their trust by busting your ass. You know, it was like freaking actually working and not going to sleep. Like that was everyone always comes up to me like, oh, you must have like have a cot in the back that you like, go no. to sleep. I was like, no, dude, I was up the whole time. And and every single episode when I when somebody would get off on the night shift and I'd be like, OK, see you later. They'd come back in the morning towards the end of my 24 hours and they'd be like, you are still here <laughs> and you're mopping. Yeah. Like you're the best. And it's amazing what. You, what friendships you can, when you work 24 hours with a group of people and you see how hard they work. Because half those people at Waffle House, that was like their third job. Yeah. They weren't just, that wasn't their only job. They they were going to clean an office building at night and then they would come back in the morning. And that puts things in perspective. And it also makes you, what the whole point of the series is, is to appreciate, again, the people behind the food and the sacrifices they make so that when you go in and you start bitching about little things, maybe you need to take a step back for a second, you know? I mean, do you see yourself doing more episodes and using it as a platform to deal with the $15 minimum wage issue and, like, shining a spotlight on that? All of that stuff. I mean, I think with BA, it's like we want to celebrate food. We don't, And food should be a happy, fun thing. But to run away from the politics of everything that's going on, there's a number of places that we're looking at. It's mostly just because uh, uh, I do believe that... St- Anytime you're over certain, let's say you're over 30, that you stay awake for 24 hours, it literally takes years off of your life. Oh, it's crazy. <laughs> um, now, Especially not on any kind of things, you no, know? just pure... Pure adrenaline. All clean, no lean. <laughs> yeah. Right? Pure, pure grease. Um, now, in winning a JBF for this, what makes uh, you think that you share this unique point of view and these stories that no one else was sort of shining a spotlight on? Uh, what put this show over the top to win the award? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, it's it's the people who are doing the filming. Obviously, you know that like editing is everything yeah. when it comes to doing uh, films. But I think it's that just that having somebody who perhaps people perceive as me, like going to fancy restaurants all the time and eating out and and then going into real places, quote unquote, and having a relationship with these people and, you know, that that the woman at Katz's who I lost her ticket that had like a $10 tip on. You had to go dig through the trash for that. Dude, she, that was, that was I real. Mean, and she was like their mad. Money. Yeah. She was mad at me. She was yeah. like, who's this new kid 
who or the other guy shirt. whose table wasn't clean enough. Yeah, that that guy was rough, man. I still, I've I've been back a couple times, and they all like I get hugs. It's great, man. I love going. It's like I'm, I'm a hero at Waffle House, which is I made my makes my kids happy too. They give you a T-shirt for that one. No, but I got to keep my badge, which still hangs on my bulletin board. It says Waffle House uh, uh, Grill Operator. Ooh. They call them grill operators. Awesome. As a Southern kid, Waffle House is like church. It's church. It's it's oh. it's the only place that's open twenty four hours. Uh, they accept all kinds of people. All are welcome there. Um, and strange things happen at the, the Waffle House, as they do at any place open. I've, so I said in the story, if the French Laundry was open for 24 hours, the same shit would go down at the French Laundry. Oh, yeah. Well, listen, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the exciting new cooking competition show that Netflix has put on that you are hosting called The Final Table. Uh, here's another song from the archives here on Snacky Tunes on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Roberta's, a super duper awesome place. Roberta's is a very, 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 very proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. We're also super awesome. Thank you, Heritage. Hello, and welcome back to Snacky Tunes. We are here with Andrew Knowlton, uh, editor at large at Bone App, and why we're really here today. Uh, other than just to say hi and how are you, <laughs> but to talk about Netflix's new cooking competition show, The Final Table. Uh, I've seen the first four episodes. It's fantastic. Um, it's huge. It's, like, it feels big. It's big. It's big, and it's um, it's big for many reasons, but I really want to start, like, why did Netflix want to get into making 
sort of this traditional, at least at the base, cooking competition show. Uh-huh. Uh, what gave him the idea to do it? Well, I mean, I, I think I can't speak for net, Netflix, yeah. but I, I do know that, like, you know, you've got Netflix now has 130 million subscribers. I believe 137. 137. You're working for Netflix now, aren't you? Hey, Netflix. How many countries? Uh, 160? 190. 190. All right, so together we got it. Yeah, we so got I'll it. So I'll cheat off you, you cheat off me. Yes. Okay. So I think just, you know, obviously they're smart cookies working at Netflix and getting into different avenues and different uh, formats of media. And I think the unscripted uh, was compelling, and they also were smart enough to recognize that food is a huge pull mm-hmm. uh, for people who watch, uh, whether they're watching on their computer or whatever. And I think that's, you know, they've started to get more into food, stuff that, like, Samin's show right now is mm-hmm. bonkers good. So bonkers. Ugly Delicious is great. Curious and, creation of, uh, yes. I'm going to say Christine, I'm going to blank the last name. Yeah. But it's crazy. It's wild. Uh, Brian Henson's on it. And I think doing it in a different format in a different way, and I think what Netflix brought to this show was this global reach. Like, this isn't just the United States. It's the Far entire... It, like, I will be dubbed in countries. Like, nobody will ever know. It's like Jerry Seinfeld. When you go to Italy, it's like, there's a guy who plays Jerry Seinfeld. That's a great... What does oh, your dad really? do? He dubbed Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> yeah. That's how he made his He's name. rich, and now he lives on Lake Como. Oh, He's my like, God. If wants to deal with the pasta. Yeah. Um, so it's just that, that I think getting that... Uh, you know, all the contestants from around the world, not just the United States, and it truly being this global... Yeah, because they have the great British baking show, as, yes. which they've licensed, but it's very much like, this is, this is the UK. This is totally UK. This is totally yeah. UK, and you yeah. have to be like an Anglophile to really be into it. Yes. And this is very much, hey, here's our top countries that we know from our data, yes. I'm assuming, I, I think that so. love food, yes. and we're going to give it to them. And they just happen to be the most compelling food countries, I think, for a lot of people globally out there well, that's as well a, at the same time. Now, having only seen the first f- four. four episodes, and I'm not going to... I guess it'll Please be, don't. Uh, it'll be out by the time this airs, but I won't spoil <laughs> anything. Um, but how did you pick the countries uh, outside of just like a data point? Because, you know, you could be like, hey, we're going to go to Indonesia. We're going to go to, you know, like uh, Africa. We're going to go to these like different countries that maybe aren't as well known for their food because it's like the UK, Mexico, things like that. I think, well, I think it's a, that's where a huge segment of the Netflix viewership lives. And also those are the dishes that I think people around the world recognize, you know, right. what do we go like Mexico? Well, you can probably guess what the national dish of Mexico is. I actually like that because everyone has uh, their own idea of what a national Dishes. And it was hard for some of the countries. Like, when we got to the United States... Oh, my God. You, did you see that episode? No, I haven't seen okay. that one. So, what do you think the national dish of the United States is? I mean, burger and fries. Fried chicken. Yeah. It, it could be many things. And it went a completely different direction, which you'll have to wait for the reveal. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, damn it. Yeah, no, no, it's good. that? No, what it's, it did there? It's, it's good. <laughs> it's, it's good because, and that's why we're not going to spoil anything. Right. Uh, but, but, like, going to Brazil, which was one of the most fascinating countries yes. that we kind of I saw went that episode, to, yeah. Is, sure. like, and people didn't know kind of what that dish was. And what's compelling, I think, about watching it is to see a two-star Michelin chef have no idea how to cook the national dish of Brazil. Well, that was really interesting, and I think it speaks also to an earlier point you made, because living in America uh, or living in L.A. or New York, you have a general idea of ethnic food at a level that's maybe not as well understood around the world. Absolutely. And, like, if you're near Queens, you know, you can sort of say... You can eat at 190 countries. You can eat at 190 countries, and... Have an idea, or at least some idea. I can envision. Maybe I don't know exactly what Malaysian food is, but right. I'm like, I know the area. I got an idea that it's gonna be like a curry, a noodle, like some sort of spices. But some of these chefs, uh, when they're New Mexico, they go, I haven't had a taco in 30 years. Which, which, when I mean, the camera wasn't on me at the time, but if you could have saw my Jaw. face, I was like, what? <laughs> you know, it was like. But that was the cool thing. Yeah. And if you remember that episode, that chef you're talking about ends up. Nailing it. Nailing it. 
and that's the beauty of the show is like seeing somebody who has no idea what Brazilian food looks like or tastes like, or even Italian food. Some of these, some of these people never cooked pasta, like traditional Italian pasta, have no idea how to cook that or whatever dish they were supposed to cook. And then, but then they, they're talented enough to come up with this dish where you're like, what is that? Like, that is amazing. To see that kind of, I know it's a terrible word, but to see that fusion on the spot. This actually gives new life to fusion. Yes. you go, it's coming from a really good place. Yes. Like, it's not coming from some cynical, take column A, column B. Right. And we'll add a little bit of sauces from column C, and here you go. Right. And throw it on a food truck. And, and go, yeah, and go. we're, we're going to call like, it. You go like, yeah. oh no, like we're going to, we have to filter this through what we know. Right. Um, and what, what you have to realize too is the, the amazing kitchen that they had and all the ingredients well, they had to choose from. Let's talk about that kitchen. Well, it's my that dream. Pantry. It's I my mean, that dream pantry. pantry is amazing. So what does the production look like? Because when you watch it, it feels like it's one very long day where one competition sort of rolling into the next. Yeah. But how much behind, how much sausage oh, no, bacon no, no. can you so, get into No, it? no, no. So I would say because there was, there's 24 uh, competitors. To start. 12 teams of two to start. Yep. So those, the first half of the show is basically when the chefs are cooking the national dish of that country mm-hmm. for our celebrity ambassadors. So there'd be two celebrities and one food critic from that country. Which is necessary. Well, it has to be because we all know that some celebrity ambassadors don't eat certain things. Right. But I would say so far, the celebrity ambassadors I've seen have had a clear point of view. Well, I think we chose people who, you know, if we were doing, let's say we were doing a uh, squid as a, an ingredient, you want to make sure that that person eats squid. Absolutely. But also, there are also people just like us who have likes and dislikes. So sure. that was good. And so the, the, the critic, which they were tough, they were kind of that evening force to be like, don't get too excited, your dish isn't that good, or hey, wait a minute, there's something going on here that I haven't seen before. Just one note on that, it's not that mean of a show. It's, it's not that mean. Well, not that's that not the point of that, it. So what? So what's the ultimate thesis then of the show? I think that the, the thesis of the show is to put these chefs from all over the world into this context where they're having to create dishes that they've never created before, but that they are so damn talented that they're able to do it. But the thing that attracted me to the show is that it wasn't bickering or that person's a fool, that person can't touch, because to me that's been done. It's shallow. Where? I've never (laughs) seen that on TV. And that, you know, feeding people lines or all that. I think the thing is we, and the reason I got, again, involved in this show is to show the beauty and the artistry of cooking. Now, one of the great things about it is that after the first round, yep. and there's people on the bottom, they will then cook for one of the most famous chefs of that country. Right, so three teams that are deemed by our first round of judges to be not so great. By the way, it's the nicest nice try I know, I've ever seen. I know, I know. But but these that's the thing with, with our star chefs that come in, and you've seen the list. It's out there. It's like Enrique Olvera oh, yeah. and Donia Duriz. It's uh, Grant Atkins. It's Claire Smith. It's on Sophie Peak. These are no – and for them to stand up and look these people in the eye, they've looked at a million people like this in their own kitchens, and their whole thing is to kind of bring people up and to encourage them. And that's ultimately what the show is doing is like somebody does have to lose. There's a, there's, there is a winner – yeah, and there are other people who don't win, but there are no losers. I mean, even the people who lose and then have to cook in the second round for these culinary greats, they're excited to be in the bottom, at least for the opportunity for these chefs <laughs> to try their food. To the point where I sort of think that the people who win, or at least they're in the middle, go, "I wish I could. Cook I for, wish I could, could cook, cook for, 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 for and, and he goes, me. "This yeah. is amazing." Um, no, a lot of them were like, "And it's so I'm, respectful." I'm so mad that yeah. I couldn't do this. That I'm in the bottom three, but now I get to shake your hand, and you get to uh, Enrique Olvera gets to critique the food I'm making. Now you would think that picking all these chefs from around the world at all these different levels, that when there's a certain country that pops up, there be an advantage. But very early on in one of the episodes, I won't say anything. You see that being from that country doesn't mean squat. I think it it hurts you more because yes. your judges who are from that country expect more. It's just like. If if you were a judge and there and let's say it's the U.S. Uh, and it's the hamburger is the dish, you're going to expect a lot from that from the, that kid from Jersey 
to, to make that he hamburger. He better make the best cheeseburger. He better make the best hamburger he can. And if it's not the best hamburger, you're going to hold go, him more accountable. I go, well, come on, dude. Like, this yeah. is, like, you, what are you giving me? I think it's the same thing as if you're a coach and your kid plays on the team, you're probably going to be harder on your on your kid. Oh, and yeah. And that's the way it, it was with this. I will say, you've only seen the first four episodes, and you, you say, oh, it's so nice and friendly and everyone... As you do go yeah, along, yeah, yeah. though, it's like those niceties and everyone gets a little bit more comfortable. A little chippy. It gets a little chippy. A little chippy, as like, they say. Like, that guy can't cook fish as much, or I cooked his fish. Yeah, I mean, you could definitely start to see certain egos yes. and personalities popping up. And you'll want to root. Like, there's people who I found myself behind the scenes being like, I'm kind of rooting for that. Kind of an underdog, oh. that person. <laughs> you know, trying to... I didn't have any say in anything. You didn't have to say anything. No. But, you know, it's... Um, it's like so many of these competition shows where you're like, we got to get through the first four or five rounds of stories to get to meet these people. You get to meet these people. I think that's really cool. But what Netflix does differently is that there's a whole other side to this show, and that is the storytelling. Yes. Because it's not just a competition show. There's also these uh, – you have the two camera interviews, which are great because yeah. those are the fun, yeah. funny sound-ups. Yeah. Uh, I'm just a Scottish guy. Yeah, who's uh, never had who's, a burrito. Who's never had a burrito, <laughs> uh, which is great for uh, when you're putting the sizzle reel together. <laughs> But you do these um, chef table type packages where yes. you really get to know these people and it's beautiful and you see the background. Um, and this is what we, this is where you're going with this and this is what yeah. is, is we're talking about behind the, 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 the people behind the, people the dishes. The behind the dish and it's yeah. not just, I just, I'm on a TV show and here's my dish. It's like when you go to Peru or wherever, and you see where this person's come from, that they're cooking for their kids or that they came from a terrible family and cooking was their only way. The way some people would pick up a guitar, they picked up a knife and that was their way out of a terrible situation. Yes. That these are human beings cooking some of the best food on the planet, and then they get to meet their idols who are silently critiquing them, and then they get to join that final table with this amazing crew of chefs. Oh, yeah. It's, and just the thing that Netflix did well, so well, is just, like, when I walked onto that stage, I'd never been a part of a production this big. You, like, I think they filmed, like, Star Trek there right before we filmed The Final Table. That's how uh, big it was. Final Frontier. The Final Frontier, the <laughs> final, final Table. table. You walk in there and you're like, holy crap. I like, mean, it's huge. It's I mean, when huge. you see it, uh, I know we joked earlier about the hydraulics budget, but... Well, the the hydraulics. I can I can tell you some stories about the hydraulics, man. That was Share one story. that was the well, that was the best part of like. That's when I felt like. Is oh. it a smooth ride? Oh, super smooth, mm. super smooth. I mean, if you if you put too much weight on it, it would slow down a little bit. Yeah, but better than like jerky. Like oh no, a, no, no, no. Uh, it was it was pretty smooth, and and that's that's what everyone was joking like. Oh, we need to get these every time we come into a restaurant. You just get lowered into the restaurant on the hydraulics. Give Vespertine kind of. like six months. They'll do it. They'll, They'll do, do it. it. You won't even be able to see your food, but you'll be able to see everybody rise on these hydraulics. Now, in telling these stories, you know, not everyone gets a story every episode. You sort of sprinkle them in throughout. You get to learn, yeah, throughout. Uh, And obviously, it goes into who's winning, who's losing, who's getting eliminated. But, you know, how did you decide to roll out the characters and the people uh, throughout each episode? Was there a plan or is sort of was the dic- the competition sort of dictated the narrative? Yeah, I think the competitions dictated the okay. narrative. And as, as we kind of went, went on and you got, people came out of the shells and you got to know them even better in, let's say, episode two, that, you know, you realize these, the personalities behind this and you wanted to tell their stories, much like, you know, it's not just this Olympic athlete who's training to win this, like, they sacrificed so much to be here, and we wanted to tell those stories. And doggone it, just like, you know, it, it, it matters to know the story behind none such restaurant in Oklahoma City, the sure. number one restaurant. You want to know uh, where, like, the, the Scottish guy's story and why he's never had a burrito before. Yeah, you know? I mean, it's pretty good because they sort of, some of them know each other. Like, they're some of the older they guard in there. Together. They some cook of them, together. Some of them have no idea who, who one another are. How did they get paired? Because some of them, you get the idea that they're friends and they cook together or they've worked together. They were. I think they, there were some that had worked together and there were some that they just thought were good personality. And, and, and a so lot it of, was casting and they paired them together? Yes. But there was a lot of them. You would think that the two, the, the people who knew each other would have an advantage. No. But as you go along, you'll see just as many who have no idea who the other person was or what they did. 
But then that's when it was interesting to see them playing off each other's strengths. Like if it was one certain competition that, oh, I've done this before, I can do it, and you'll see that person take the lead. And I think the teams that don't succeed ultimately are the ones who don't work together. It's kind of a no-brainer. It's quite a, it's a no-brainer. Now, yeah. as a host, I mean, obviously you, you sort of hosted uh, working at 24 Hours, and that's a different sort of, yeah. type of hosting because you're there just to – push along this documentary, fly on the wall type of stuff. But where do you see your roles as a host here? And obviously, you know, you had 10, 10 episodes, is it? 10 episodes, 10 episodes yeah. To sort of, and you're, you're finding your feet like that, but like, are you a mentor? Are you a guide? Are you just there to push along? Like, where do you see your well, role? Well, I mean, I think, I think the reason that I was able, lucky enough to do this was for something we've talked about already is I... I'd like to think I know what I'm talking about. Yes. And I think when I go to these tables with these chefs and I can converse with them in a way that they respect and I can speak their language. Mm-hmm. And I think my job on the show was to kind of hold it together, be that kind of, uh, you know, when they are stressing to to make a joke and to come over and be like, it's just food, you know, yeah. like we're just all having a good time here. And so hopefully, I mean, I've, I've still keep in touch with all these guys on social media. We've had to, like, we can't talk to each other really oh, yeah. that much. But now that, now that the, it's slowly the contestants is like, and these are an amazing, like they are all doing dinners at each other's restaurants now. Like that, and you have that camaraderie because uh, we filmed this show, you know, over a long period. It's like a month, you know. Oh, really? Yeah. So they were... You know, it's, a, it's a huge commitment outside of their restaurants to come and do something like this. How so, long did it take to do one episode? Well, if at the beginning of the episodes, because there were so many competitors, it took one day to do half an episode. Woof. And then once we got down to, you know, 10 contestants, we could knock out one in an entire day. It's a long day. It's a long day. And it's a long day for those guys and gals when you're cooking. And this is what I've always said about the art form of cooking is like, there's very few that you can do something in an hour and then you just show somebody like, here's what I made you and they get to critique the hell out of it. Like with movies or music, yeah, you can play live, but you've probably rehearsed that before. Sure. Or, or with a podcast, you can edit it a little bit. Oh, we don't edit. You don't edit. No, it. no, no. We're live to tape. <laughs> well, there you go. So what you see is what you get. And yeah. with food, it's that same way. It's like, I think when people knock some people's dishes and I'm guilty of it too, or any of us go into a place where like, oh, that food sucks. Sometimes it did. But it's like, wow, what pressure to like go and cook something when there's a thousand other people in a room eating that same amount of food. And like, I think that's what it made me realize watching these guys who are so talented do what they do is like, even they screw up sometimes, you know, Absolutely. and, and that's, that's where and sometimes they knock it out of the park. Sometimes they know they screw up. Uh, but that's what's interesting about the pairs is there's always it's not just you. You have somebody else to help you out. Yeah. By the way, if there's not some sort of Netflix final table pressure cooker e-com play coming out of this series. Do you want a piece of that? I mean, <laughs> I, don't need a, I, don't need a, I don't need a piece, but I mean, those pressure cookers are working overtime in, in the shows. Pressure cookers are, even for the home chef now, I'm like, if people don't have a pressure cooker at home, I mean, I don't. They're just, I don't. I don't mess with them. They're, I, I don't. they're so easy now, though. They're, yeah, they're, not, your, they're not like they're, the old ones where you mo- can blow your head okay, off. Okay, so here we go. Final table, pressure cooker, not your mother's pressure cooker. Yeah. There you go. I can see it on the billboard. You can right see it on, on the billboard sunset. and sunset. <laughs> they own the billboards now. Um, now, before we run out of time, uh, you know, obviously this is the first season, but Netflix is well known for green lighting second season, third seasons, things like that. Where do you see the final table sitting in sort of the pantheon of cooking shows? What sort of community do you want it to create? And, and how do you see it maybe even changing the way food cooking competition shows are done? Well, I mean, I just, I just think the seriousness and the kind of non soap opera way of going about this and just showing the beauty of super talented people cutting a piece of fish or vacuum sealing foie gras and showing people at home kind of how to sous vide it on their own. I think ultimately it just ushers in a new era of food competition shows and, and in, in that it's global. Mm. This is not half of the shows are through a translator. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, when we go to Spain, like, there's yep. a translator standing next to me. So it's it's certainly it was made in the United States, but it has a global perspective. And it will be big with any with, – with my fingers crossed 
in Italy and in Norway and in places that aren't even represented in there. So I think that's the thing is just bringing food is such a global conversation that we have now. No matter where you go, you can always talk about food. And I think that's what this show will do is like people are going to root. If you're from Japan, you're going to root for the Japanese competitors. Or maybe you're not. Maybe, maybe you're going to maybe you're going to root for the American or yeah. you're going to root from the Scottish guy. Yeah. So I think that that kind of globalness and like it's not just. English people cooking pies, or it's not just American people yelling at each other and throwing tantrums. It's this kind of thing where we're one big planet. We all cook food. It's all kind of similar. We all grab from different ingredients. All grab from the same pantry. Same pantry, literally. And at the end of the day, it's just about making people happy and welcoming people to the table. It sounds cheesy, but that's what it's about. Well, hopefully when it, it airs and you're back in Greece at the food markets on a Saturday come morning... <laughs> One of the, the grandmothers would be like, I saw you, and I appreciate what you did for Here's me. some rosemary. It's on me. It's on me. They wouldn't do that in Greece. Well, Andrew, thank you so much. <laughs> if people want to watch the show, where can they go? November 20th, Netflix. It's already, you know you know what Netflix is. Just, oh, yeah. Yeah. Everywhere. Everywhere. And just and, and one thing is, like, I've told my mom this. I've told all my friends, just, like, just keep it running. Even if you leave the house, just let it run. Oh, yeah. So. It's all about completion. Yes, it it's is. It's all about, about completion, completion and as fast as possible. Yes. And if people want to follow your writing, see what you're up to is the editor at large for Bon App. Yeah, just bonapetit.com. I have, I'm writing a column every month for them and Andrew O. Knowlton on all the social media handles, too. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking Thanks the for time. having me, man. Uh, we'll see you in Austin at some point, I'm sure. I will show you some of the best Migas tacos you've ever had. Oh, uh, well, we, you know, same thing with sports. We're going to need a whole other podcast Great. because I'll, I'll I have my opinions. <laughs> I'll just say real quick, Paul Vos. I love Paul Vos. Okay, then we're fine. Okay, right. good. <laughs> thank you so much. Woo. Thank you, Matt, for setting this up. Uh, that's the show. We'll see you next week. Thank you to Heritage Radio Network. This has been Snacky Tunes. We we'll have your host, Aaron Bresnitz. We'll catch you next time. We talk about food. We talk about music. With musical dudes. Finger on the pulse. Snacky Tunes. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please... Join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.